Jesus. Hello and welcome to episode 7.04 of the show that today welcomes back a legend. But who is that legend? Is it Darth Hernandez? Is it Magic Yodaberg? Could it be <laughs> Luke Skycarver? Or could it even be Obi Dan Capazzi? <laughs> or it could be Vieira. Whoa. This question and so many more will be answered on today's episode of The Gooners Pod. Once upon a time, way back when there were only 9,000 Arsenal podcasts, five young men from various backgrounds, an Irish kid with a horrible haircut, a young Jewish nerd who hadn't discovered food yet, a child from Hemel Hempstead who didn't want to be English no more, a handsome advertising magnate with impeccable judgment, and a young Mexican AC Milan fan hatched a plan to take over the world of Arsenal podcasts. But then these boys became men. Jared. Mikey. Ewan. Magic. And Andy. And the rest, my friends, is history. And now, all these years later, you tune in every so often to hear their incredible takes, their football knowledge, and their sensual advice. But now, it's gone too far. You, our fans, are at long last witness to season... Seven! 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 Welcome to the Gooners Pod. I feel like someone's put LSD in my Coke or something. Like, what have I just watched there? <laughs> you know, that, that's this show's already, uh, what is it, uh, 25 times longer than your first podcast today on We Judges TV? <laughs> oh, I know, tell you what. And do you know what, Mike, I must say, I'm loving that, loving the cap, the baseball cap's class, man. You know, anytime, uh, anytime I get a gift from, from, you know, a mega media superstar, I have to wear it every time I'm with them. So uh, this was uh, this was handed to me by Dan Potts within two minutes of me meeting him for the first time. Um, it is about an hour after my normal soup time, so I'm having liquid soup today instead. But it's Friday, y'all, and um, and 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 this is going to be a fun show. We've got to, to ensure that it's going to be fun. We have Jared with us. Great to see you, Jared. Yeah, likewise. It's been a little while since I've been able to to jump on. So looking forward to it. Nice. And of course, the returning legend, Dan Potts. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, or maybe not the legend that we were referring to in the show title, but Dan's back to uh, to spend his Friday evening with us. Welcome back. Pleasure to be on, man. Great to see you both. So now you have recently been on a trip that seemed pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Now, you know, I know you're excited about Arsenal returning to the Europa League this year. You've, you've made no bones about that. But what dedication, mate? I mean, going to scout our group stage opponents one by one. Um, you're a legend, dude. I mean, you you we have a, a, a picture of Dan in Croatia scouting Dinamo Zagreb right now. Um, you know, <laughs> the dedication is, is is amazing. Now, the one thing I do notice about this is um, you know the 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 water, Jared, is like a little bit different color in the immediate surroundings around Dan. <laughs> Didn't didn't your mom tell you like to go before you got in the water? Do you know Do you know what is hilarious? Because the amount of comments I've had is like, you look like one of those football hammerheads where you're a tiny body on a massive head. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't notice it until I'd put it up. I thought, what a beautiful scenery. And you know, like well, the, 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 I think the uh, you know just to bring our, our our layman viewers up, the water has a refractory element to it where the where the where the light waves tend to bend when it goes in the water. Here and comes that, the science. <laughs> and it, yeah, and and that's uh, that's the reason why I'm only two inches long in most of my pictures, because um, I'm always in the water. But no such problems for Dan. And, and uh, it looked really scenic, man. I mean, like like there's 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 the legend Dan with uh, in, in Dubrovnik, I believe. Yeah, Dubrovnik, unbelievable place, man. The scenery is stunning, mate. Absolutely amazing. So um, yeah, yeah, me and my parents. Did you climb up that? 
No, did I hell, man? And we got a taxi. <laughs> Does it go straight up the side, or is there? A you can do it. Yeah, you, there's a, so there's a there's a there's a cable car that you can get, but it costs like forty euros each to go in it, and it's over in two minutes. Or you can get a cab for fifty euros between the three of you. So do you yeah, know what? There's a joke. There's a joke just just yeah, there isn't there isn't an end or a joke there, but we'll, we'll skip past that. And uh, yeah, you and do you know what? It was uh, cost forty quid and ended in less yeah. than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't quite where I was going with it, but no, that's beautiful. Oh, and, and of course, no, the, lovely, the lovely Donna Potts with a, with a clean outfit with no red wine spilled all over it is is a. Uh, is not a where, while, while you're thing. while you're not near her, mate, she'll be fine. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, she can she can wear whatever she wants without worrying about it being burgundy or whatever the same color or whatever she's drinking that night or whatever I'm drinking that night. And then uh, and then your lovely wife, uh, Stephen, just look, <laughs> looking beautiful as always. Beautiful. Uh, just a it's a happy family right there you're only missing uh you know a, a, the one a, you love the most a special one you know <laughs> yeah Not the one who loves you the most <laughs> one who loves you the most but yeah i've always wanted to go man i've always wanted to go to dubrovnik and uh they said look we're going croatia next year and i said oh i've always wanted to come and they said well come on in come with us so obviously as you know i'm close to my mom and dad so i thought you know what let's just do it two two years of our holiday for most people to be honest because of covid and i thought let's just do it man and i loved every minute of it and do you know what i loved the most the only person i spoke to, i have a guess mike the only person i spoke to about anything to do with football it wasn't lee it wasn't hoggy you know him very very well and he's always in our whatsapp group Telling us about the weather, shouting voice notes every morning at us. The only person he spoke to. Why would to, you, why to would you ruin your vacation by talking to an listen, upside down headed ginger troll? Listen, he spoke to me, okay? It wasn't me speaking to him. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just polite, you know me, so I replied. But um, no, nah, it's all good. What's this, Mott? So you don't take lead judges on the. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's he's def definitely not coming on holiday with me. Absolutely no way. I've got I got a lot of pictures of no, Lee Judges joking. on holiday too. I've got him in Dubai. I've he got goes him like he goes a little bit different to Mike Tan. I tell you that I've actually got a tan, believe it or not. But this is good for me for him. Oh my god, he looks like an extra out of Benidorm when he goes away, doesn't he? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what? So what kind of? I mean, the 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 people want to know what kind of lodging do the Dan Potts of the world's uh, multi multimedia superstar, man in demand, titan of industry, <laughs> what kind of lodging do, does he treat his family to? I mean, is it, we're, we're talking four star resort, Michelin star restaurant. Do you know what? It was, it was actually, it was actually, we got upgraded, believe it or not, because um, when we'd booked, they, they phoned my mom and they said, look, we've, we, because of the season that you're going, we have, um, we have to upgrade you because our hotel that we've booked you in is only open for four of the days that you're there. So we're going to upgrade you and give you half board. So it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So, um, yeah, mate, it was beautiful. Like that was the scenery every day by a pool, by the beach. You saw, obviously my body's a bit bigger there. I think maybe I was having a good day. Um, but, um, yeah, it was you stunning, holding man. your breath. If, so it was like, like... <laughs> if no one's been to Dubrovnik, get yourself over there. If you're a game of Thrones fan, you'll love it because obviously they set the scenes there and they take you on the tour of all the buildings that they filmed and they show you the pictures of where everything was filmed and, it was just stunning, man. If no one's been, get yourself over there, man. All I will say is make sure you go half board because when you if you go self catering, um, you'll be skint. Because trust me, it was very expensive. Like London prices for like drinks, which is cool, but food was like, I don't know, maybe take fifty quid for a meal because you'll need it. Jeez. All right, and and the final video we have of 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 this incredible oh, trip prior to going and in, you know getting into some football talk is uh you know we saw that nice pool here here's dan enjoying himself at the pool <laughs> never you, you can't find mike feinberg without an arsenal shirt on it just doesn't happen uh, you know the um we get these these this incredible video from podcasters and, and media superstars from all over the world you know i think most of it comes through the gerbil um, because the gerbil has has his has his or her people just all over the place taking video of Dan Pool on the slide. It's amazing. And uh, any you know any worry about you in that in that one uh, looking too small is, uh, is <laughs> so so. Let's get some business out of the way quickly. Um, you're everywhere now. You're on Lee Judges TV. You're on AFTV. You're on BFTV. You're on uh, and, and a new venture that every you know that everyone's finding out about now, which is uh, football's twelfth man. It's a channel where apparently all of the thumbnails 
involve you just standing there with your arms crossed, uh, <laughs> looking like looking all hard like this. I mean, that if there's no if there was not a better reason to start a YouTube channel than to just you know have it all be you know. Then uh, I've, I've, I've put on I've put on some weight since then. I can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on on a serious note, though, you're branching out beyond Arsenal content. Um, mm. You know, seeing a little bit of this on on the YouTubes, but uh, tell us a little bit more about the kind of the concept of the channel. We're we going to see, you know, which top influencers we're going to see, which bottom influencers are we going to see? Are Jewish people allowed on it? I mean, we want to know the type, you know, the questions. That... <laughs> we're talking of uh, talking of uh, a Jewish person. Uh, Julian was on with us earlier, I saw that. and I, I saw I, I saw, but I didn't have my obviously as we know earlier. Lee was in control, so I couldn't put any comments up or anything. And then, uh, anyway, I saw your comments saying what. Jewish people are allowed on here, <laughs> <laughs> and I just started laughing anyway. Um, no, I but thank you for the... tell when you've read my comment. But... <laughs> you can see Danny's the same. Danny, Jan, Danny, the GFP, and Mike Feinberg. I just start smiling, or normally the Gooners pod in here. But um, anyway, I yeah. So thanks for the plug, man. Uh, yeah. So I started a couple of weeks ago um, and launched it, and I've done about five or six videos now, and it's just literally Premier League content. I do enough about Arsenal. I need a break from it sometimes, but uh, we. We're going to be doing quite a lot on transfers uh, and I'm inviting influencers on from every other channel as well. So I've got an influencer from every Premier League show that has committed to the channel, which is, be really, which is really good of them. Uh, some of them you'll know, a lot of them you'll know from the Big Six. Uh, if you watch that show with Turkish, so it'll be Big Steve from Man City, Grizz from Liverpool, Tobes from Spurs, um, Matisse from Chelsea. So we've got quite a few of uh, those coming on and I've managed to uh, confirm a few shows so i'm going to do kind of a, a relegation fight for survival show with those that are down there we don't want to assume but i assume it will be the oh, forests be the fulhams the, those kind of stuff then we're going to do the best of the rest and then we're going to do race for europe um i was going to do a title challenge but i'm going to get bored of speaking to liverpool and city every week so let's just uh, let's just leave that one towards the end of the season but that's the idea uh there's going to be some quizzes involved there's going to be some debates involved uh some combined 11s of teams of old some nostalgia for example we'll get a manchester united Man Manchester City, Chelsea and Arsenal fan on a debate who had the best uh, team, title winning team, uh, do a combined 11 of those kind of things. So there'll be loads of content throughout the summer and also when the season starts, we'll be doing some regular shows uh, about progress uh, or process as everyone likes to call it. So um, I'm looking forward to it, mate. And um, I'm humbled, to be honest. I did not think I would uh, I would have this much support and love for it, man. So it's been amazing, to be honest, to do the five videos I've got. I, I expected to see uh, about 50 or 60 people join so to get the numbers i'm getting um um, i'm very humbled by it man so uh, thanks for the plug man hey no problem and it's 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 pretty refreshing too there's so many not just arsenal podcasts but team specific podcasts it's nice Mm -hmm. to have one that's going to have a plethora of teams a plethora of voices and just a little bit of a view of the league top to bottom not just the one specific team so it's nice to have something that's a little bit different than the norm and what we see in a lot of the premier league football podcasts too yeah, and yeah. and not and not just the oh hey I mean not that this is a bad idea and people you know I, a, a lot of our very good friends including you and and so do this every week and 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 it's very interesting but you know it's usually the we'll have a West Ham fan on the the the, ga- the day before the West Ham game or yeah you know, the, the upcoming opponent but it's not a it's not necessarily you know what are people thinking around the league all the time to be honest that was how i started it to be honest of, of the idea because i wanted to, i wanted to kind of people said to me for a while like do you want to do your own thing or are you just gonna kind of and i said no i don't really need to do my own thing i love what i do i love going and jumping on everyone else's and then i can just don't have to i just have to talk and then leave and there's no setting up do you know what i mean it's easy so <clears throat> it's, it's it's kind of i'm fine by that and um and then Lee said, you know, I'd love you to come on board with me. I said, of course, mate, I always help you out. You know, I get on very, very well with Lee. Um, and I thought perhaps there's a gap in the market. I don't want to do another Arsenal channel because if I'm honest with you, I'll just be talking the same stuff I'm talking on Lee, AFTV, Harry's channel, you Tom's channel, channel, your channel. channel. Where, I'm sorry, but you, you should have started another Arsenal channel where you just have all the opposite opinions of what you have on your normal channel. <laughs> it's like the Bizarro Pops channel where you're like, I, the Arteta is the greatest hire. I don't care about the lack yeah. of experience. I think we're doing great. Like, like come I on just, with an I love Cronky shirt or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, well, I uh, guess I could be. You could call it the Gooners pot. But uh, but no, the yeah. uh, no, it's a, it's a great idea. I'm 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 excited to see it. And you know, the football community is one that has been very tribal on, like like Jared was saying, on YouTube. And I think you're starting to see that break down a little bit. And some people might not like that, but there are some areas 
Um, and I think uh, one of them, not to put you on the spot, but we've talked about this, one of them is going to be charity. And so, you know, my hope is to be able to, as I've said many times, take Gunners versus cancer and uh, gradually becoming, you know, football versus cancer. And, and with, people, with people like you laying the groundwork for inner inner club relationships, not necessarily friendships per se, there's still got to be banter. There's still got to be some walls, but, but uh, you know, working collectively to promote good causes and good content are obviously uh, uh, positive. So, um, so great. You got to check that out. It's football's 12th man on YouTube. Is that, yeah football's 12th man podcast so uh, you'll find it on youtube um i appreciate that mike thank you and of course man we'll we'll hook up we always do anyway and um i'm more than happy to get what you're doing involved in other clubs and uh, i know for a fact the influencers would be more than happy to promote whatever's needed man so we can we can 100 sort that and uh big up fergus in the chat by the way because um i ain't gonna lie that's where it all started with me <laughs> on guns and yellow ribbons so remember your roots man and um I think he, he came in here to prompt you to say that uh, ah, yeah, man. Always, man. Always got time for them. Over Fergus, there. Great podcast. Fergus, is, Fergus is, uh, is is a source for a lot of things, um, and uh, source of your success. He, uh, he he's very informed. He's a source of a lot of uh, BMWs around the world, and and it's uh, <laughs> and it's fantastic. And I love that he's a source of of uh, putting a lot of beer into his mouth. And as we found out early yesterday morning, he's uh, he's going to be a bachelor for the opening night game against Crystal Palace. Which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, um, so watch out, little people. Uh, he's going to be on the prowl. So, speaking of brand new content, we're unveiling. And Jared, you don't even know this, but we're unveiling a brand new segment on the Gooners podcast for our Friday shows. Uh, and I act like we do Friday shows all the time. We don't, but we're <laughs> hoping, hoping to. And um, and the segment is called the Gooners Pod Arsenal. Week in review. I mean, you, you're going to get the top quality production specs on the Gooners Pod. I mean, if you want the best, worst production values, this is the podcast for you. So, um, this was a light week of Arsenal news, said no one ever. Um, <laughs> everything's happened. So, I'm going to kind of go day by day through the, the summary of the of the topics, and then we'll break them down kind of one by one in a, in a more roundtable format, uh, which is code for I'm going to stop talking as much as I have been and let you guys talk some. Um, starting on Monday, Arsenal announced Marquinhos. Wait, hold on. Wrong Marquinhos. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one a lot better anyway, man. Um, a 19-year-old from Brazil dubbed the next Martinelli. ESR, <laughs> Neil Smith Rowe, who clearly needs rest right now, plays 75 minutes in a meaningless dead rubber U21 Euros qualifier. Do I have a picture of that? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, and most importantly, the Gooners podcast season seven begins, ending a two-month hiatus. Hey! We're back. Um, so Tuesday, I'm gonna, I better get this off the screen. Lucas Torreira's desired employers, Fiorentina, apparently lost all the Vlavich money in the couch uh, that they got, and <laughs> nothing left to pick up a 12 million pound buy option on him, crushing the poor little guy, making him cry, and returning to London to become an Arsenal player again, perhaps. We'll, we'll go into that a little bit more detail. Um, 5,293 salty Arsenal Twitter accounts start tweeting that Arsenal are dithering and failing and falling behind again because we've only signed one guy in the first three days of the transfer window, and it gets especially bad when Eve Basuma is suddenly going to Spurs for 25 million pounds. We'll talk about that Wednesday. we got to talk about Jerby. He broke the internet on Wednesday by informing, not predicting, <laughs> informing the – Arsenal podcast or not or uh, Twitter sphere that for the second year running Arsenal start the Premier League season off on a Friday night this time at our bogey stadium of Selhurst Park and then of course on Thursday the schedule comes out and Jerby was proven right Friday the 5th of August 8 p.m. Selhurst Park will we conquer our demons will we be fit to wear the shirt we'll see and then of course Later in the day, five million people find out at the exact same time who Fabio Vieira is and immediately either fall in love with the best Portuguese footballer of all time or they decide that because they never heard of him, he must be a massive waste of money. Um, on Friday, today, Arsenal tie down their number 
their new number 14. Sorry, Tom Canton, but Eddie Niketia has officially made the squad. Hundred grand a week, too. Bit rich for my blood, but it's still four million pounds a year less than Theo Walcott's last contract. And we've been linked from legitimate media, not rodents and other uh, ITK, <laughs> with Tielemans, Gabi Jesus, Aaron Hickey, Lissandro Martinez, Lotaro Martinez, Eddie Guerrero, Connor McGregor, and Anthony Joshua. Um, are Arsenal doing bits in the market or not? So that's your – hold on. See, I'm like Lee Judges here. That is your The Gooners Pod Arsenal Week in Review. Review. That sexy, gravelly voice that only I'm capable of. That voiceover guy's class. I mean, yeah, we... we uh, <clears throat> Do you pay him a lot or...? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I reward him manually. <laughs> All right, so Monday, let's let's start with you, Jared. Marquinhos, do we see him on the pitch this season? Is he Saka and Pepe's Europa League replacement or something more than that? I certainly don't think he's more than that. And it's a little unfortunate for him. You know the next time that we got a, a younger guy from Brazil that no one was familiar with, he's the next Martinelli. It's unfortunate that that's always good, what fans are going to put on guys that come in from a, from a young age. And, and we kind of forget that guys like Saka, Smithrow, Martinelli, are very much the exception, not the rule. It's tough to find a guy of that age that's going to come in and contribute a large amount, especially in the Premier League season. That said, you know, we are playing in Europe, those those early round Europa League games, the cup games. Potentially we see him there, but I think at least for him, given the the background, we should temper our expectations a little bit. You know, it's not a guy who's played football in any sort of major league at this point. So I would say give him some time. You know, he, he's one that we're going to see sparingly this season. But, you know, it'll be nice to see him in the Arsenal shirt. And, you know, if you do get lucky and strike gold like we have on a couple of those other guys, that's fantastic. And, you know, our, our front office will look like a bunch of geniuses. But I think as fans, we need to temper our expectations on somebody like him and, and give him a chance to come in and sort of acclimate himself and, and just get his feet underneath him before we start putting any sort of crazy expectations on him as far as you know the next martinelli and, and the likes of that yeah i mean but the, and the similarity not doesn't just stop at young unknown brazilian it's very early transfer window move first move of the transfer window so dan you know when when the first taste is a transfer window it obviously gives license to people saying okay here we go again we're we're not really moving on anybody big we're just picking up these little scraps now i think people would you know three years ago this month saying that we'll feel pretty dumb at this point because of what Martinelli's turning into. Uh, I'm not going to use past tense because he's not all the way there yet, but, you know, and what they did later in the summer with Tierney, Luis, Pepe, again, whether it was successful or not, you can't deny that there was intent there. So um, your, your take on Marquinhos, given that he doesn't seem to be the only move that we're making this summer. Yeah, it doesn't shock me. Um, we like this, and Edu certainly does. Um, I don't know much about him, Mike, if I'm honest with you, but I knew nothing about Martinelli either. Um, so what does everyone do? They go on YouTube, and they start to watch him and think, oh, my God, we've got the next Neymar. Um, the last time I looked... I, I, because like you're going to get such a biased view, either good or bad from him. Like, of course. Like... I did it with uh, Mustafi, and I thought, wow, Cannavaro, here we come. <laughs> uh, so um, well, you can't do that. You know, and uh, I think with Mark Winners, I'm not quite sure, and I don't, I'd love to get your guys' opinions on this, is is he going to be a squad player? Is he going to be loaned out? Is he going to be something that we look at as a replacement for one of the players that potentially is leaving? I know there's rumours of Pepe may be going out. I, I, I don't really know where this one's going because I don't know enough about him to know if he's ready. So I think that this could be that we loan him out. It's either going to be like a Martinelli or a Wellington Silver, isn't it, this one? Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. going to be one that we never see again, or it's going to be one that comes in, does a little bit and thinks, oh, actually, he's got a little bit of, of, of talent and technique, and maybe we could mould him into a, another player that could learn off of the Martinelli Sackers and Smith Rose. But I, I really am quite up in the air with this one, if I'm honest. Well, we've got Bertonian in the chat uh, saying Sky, Port, Sky Sports just reported Arsenal of cool interest in Tielemans. And he'll stay at Leicester. We will double back to that when we start talking about Vieira, uh, because I, I think guess that's that, not true. I, I guess that's not true. No, I, I I would think that that's not true. Um, I'm mm. seeing just as not as much stuff that that's a uh, that that's still very much on. But uh, but we can talk about whether it makes sense, whether whether it's something 
else needed as well. But uh, but Marquinhos is an interesting one, and for three million pounds, and don't start me on we could have gotten him for free and we paid three million. That's we're so dumb. That's a long term play. That's an investment mm-hmm. in a relationship. That's not an investment in a player. Um, and 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 I just think if you're if you're really mincing words about having paid money where it wasn't owed uh, for this player, you're not quite thinking rationally about how how finances and clubs and that sort of thing works. Um, it you know it, Sao Paulo's next great player, the next Neymar coming suit to Sao Paulo, we have a relationship with them. Doesn't mean that we'll get them, but uh, that's a uh, it's just a much much bigger issue than than having paid unnecessarily for somebody and ESR just, I mean, I would have been okay if he came off the bench for the senior team in those nations league games, but to have him start and play, I think more than once in this latest round of U 21 qualifiers. I mean, I I would have liked to have seen Arteta kind of put his, put his foot down a little bit. Uh, Balogun playing in those games is fine with me, but ESR needs some break. Doesn't he? I would think so. And I was with you. I was glad to see Balogun getting minutes. I mean, he's somebody we want playing. We want getting experience, kind of putting himself out there potentially for a good loan move if we can find one. So I think that makes perfect sense. But as far as Smith Rowe, I'm with you. We've got a, a busy season with extra competitions from this year. And also with the World Cup in the middle, it, it's really condensed. I mean, we're, we're going to have our 15, 16 fixtures into the Premier League by, I think, mid-November this year. And last year we didn't hit that until, you know, second, third week of December. So they're really packed in there pretty tightly to accommodate the world cup. So, I mean, every summer I'd like to get guys to get rest, but especially this summer with the tight schedule and all the extra games, it it would certainly be nice to see those guys get a little bit of time off in between and not feel like they're on a, you know, a year round schedule, which is what football's starting to feel like a lot of years. Yeah, there's really. Yeah, I, I'm with you, man. I, I I hate international football. I can't stand it, man. I can't stand it. Unless it's the World Cup and the Euros, I don't care. This Nations League, what even is it? And who actually cares? The friendlies do my head in. And uh, this was a time that people need for rest, which is going to be a rest up for what's going to be a busy season with a World Cup thrown in the middle, like you say, Jared. So I think when you look at that, that was a madness decision. But I don't think these managers care because they are the manager of the England 21s in England and they will play who they believe they can do. And I unfortunately, I don't like it because I think the relationship should be better with the with the managers, but it's never existed. Sir Alex Ferguson and Arsene Wenger used to complain about it years and years and years. It's no different now. Yeah, but ESR is a future senior player. He may even, in my view, especially if he starts the season off well, be in the, the, the squad the and the yeah. for, for, for Doha, for, for, for Qatar. And, um, and and why would you – I mean, this was a dead rubber. This was a game – I'm not going to show the picture again. This was, this was the um, – that was also from Croatia, by the way. Um, this was uh, a game that absolutely did not matter whatsoever, uh, which I think, I think they even ended up losing it. But it didn't matter. They were qualified for the tournament already. So, I mean, don't, don't put your best talent out there. You didn't need that. Um, anyway, it's done. It's over. As far as I know, he, he didn't end up any worse for wear, but – uh, but like you said, Jared, the, the first 13 weeks of the season, we have 13 or 14 weeks of the season, we have 22 games, possibly 23, depending on what happens in the League Cup. That is insane. 16 Premier League games, six Europa League games, and and probably two League Cup games. Um, we're going to need a lot more than, uh, than than a bunch of tired players starting at the beginning of the season. Um, Tuesday. Interesting day. Lucas Torreira. Now, I'm going to briefly get my thoughts out, and then I'm going to send it back around the circle the other way to you, Dan. Um, I've always loved Lucas Torreira. He clearly doesn't love being in London, but he seemed to be having a pretty good time before uh, before Unai Emery pushed him up field, up, up the pitch way too far, playing him out of position, and then the whole thing, kind of, the wheels all came off. He wanted to stay in Italy. He's not staying in Italy. We're not re-signing him. We're not selling him for under 10 or 11 or 12 million pounds anyway. He's on 50 grand a week, which is not abnormal. I would rather just somehow there be a detente, a.k.a. a truce or some sort of like, you know what, we want you here. We will let you go after this year on a free. We won't sell you, but we're not going to keep you here. We're not going to do anything else. We're not going to loan you. We want you to be here as Thomas Partey's primary backup. Uh, you will get some playing time because we're, you know, we're in all these different competitions and, uh, and just get the year out of him and let him go. 
I, I think he's probably more polished than 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 uh, Lakanga is at this point. He's certainly serves a different function than an Elneny, and we still have Elneny if we need him. And we got a lot, a lot of games. So uh, you know, is that was that part of the thinking when it came to Basuma? Was what do you think, or is he going to be gone by the end of the transfer window? I'd like to think it wasn't part of the thinking with Basuma because um, <clears throat> I think we need somebody just like him, if I'm honest with you, because Thomas Partey's proved for two years that he can't stay fit without European football. So what chances he got this year? Um, I still think it's a position we need. And when Unai Emery signed him, believe it or not, to, uh, Torreira was my one of my favourite players, along with Aubameyang. I've just loved him. He was a battler. He was a little terrier. He would not let you have the ball for longer than a few seconds without putting a tackle in and he could actually pass and spray the ball. And then when there was that double pivot of him and Chaka, I actually thought he was a lot better than Granite Chaka. What are you saying, Eoin? How are you doing? Um oh, he called you. He called I, you uh, I'm sorry, you're right, Flo. Go, go. <laughs> but I, I must say, I, I do feel like this is time up for Lucas Torreira. And as much as I wouldn't be against him stay in for a season to do a job I honestly don't feel like he wants that and I think that if we have an unhappy player um, it's probably best to try and find him a club and and you know I feel personally like we need to try to move forward not hang on to a player that clearly for the last two years has wanted to try and leave I just find it very odd Mike that no one has kind of kept him two years running now because I don't think we're asking much. I think they'll probably be between 10 and 15 million. And for that, for me, for an international who clearly does a holding midfield role quite well, I think is a steal. But maybe there's some problems there mentally. Maybe there's some personal traits that they don't like. But it seems to me that they're just not interested in keeping hold of him now, which is a bizarre one for me. So, um, yeah, maybe he'll end up staying because nobody wants him. But I'll be amazed if he is in an Arsenal shirt um, end of the window, if I'm honest. Yeah, Owen, this is a weird one because... And and welcome to the pod, Owen. Um, He... He hasn't really. I, I don't. I don't watch you know Fiorentina games very often, except for when I was at the Fiorentina game and didn't realize that Vlahovic was playing because uh, he wasn't Vlahovic yet. But um, I didn't. I, I haven't seen him play there, but I mean, I, I, I haven't been under the impression that he's lost a significant amount of his skill and pace and and tenaciousness that he had when he played in the World Cup and was man marking guys out of the out of the park and, and, and playing so well for us in the early stages. So if he's still that same player and he's what, maybe 27, 28, maybe I, I, I he might even be younger than that. He's, he's younger than that. I think yeah. he's 25, 26, 25, 26. Maybe. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, what, how is he not a, a, at least a 15 or 20 million pound player? I mean, my God, so Dominic Solanke was 18 or 19 million pounds. So Torreira, I mean, that's why I don't want to sell him for eight or nine. I don't want to sell him just to sell him. I'd rather keep him around, you know, and and maybe he doesn't even play at all unless yeah. if we can keep our guys healthy ahead of him. But, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, well, I think that, um, well, first of all, let me say this. The only reason I'm on this podcast is because I was having a couple of drinks and my missus was like, are you drinking alone on a Friday night? And I was like, I better socialize with somebody, I suppose. So that's why I popped on. But in regards to Lucas Torreira, um I think it's very easy to forget that he wasn't some sort of bit part player at Arsenal originally. He came in and he and he had hit the ground running, and people thought that this was our answer to Ingalo Kante, that that he was this diminutive little defensive midfielder that could break up play, and that's exactly what he did. And for all the praise, I think that hindsight presents Unai Emery and and sort of the. Uh, the opposite of Arteta inners. I don't want to say Arteta outers because it's much more complicated than that. But people who are against Arteta always look back and say that how well Unai Emery did. But it really was, in my opinion, Unai Emery's management of Lucas Torreira that completely dismantled his Great. Arsenal career. I think that, uh, you know, whilst the scene in theory, what he was trying to do, you know, having your most uh, aggressive press or your, your most diminutive in- interceptor of the ball, playing furthest forward to try and win the ball back high up. It, it just didn't work. And I think it really sort of, he was still very, very, very early on in his Arsenal career at that stage. And, you know, I think when you put so, someone through a na- negative experience like that, especially with the, obviously the personal uh, losses that he, he endured whilst at Arsenal, I just don't think it was ever a match made in heaven, if I'm being completely honest with you. And look, there's no shame in saying 
some people just aren't cut out for the English culture. It's it's it just isn't for some people. You know, we see a lot of Italian players stay within Serie A, and I think that might just be the reason is that they're just not suited to that type of culture. But before people you jump keep in, telling me I'm not suited for the English culture. And the people I'm going to pour this. Would you see this, English by the way, people. while I give you a good answer? This is life changing, Jared. You know how much I love Guinness. This is uh, called the Nitro Surger. This isn't a paid advertisement, by the way. Look at this thing. It's insane. It like surges up your Guinness. It's great. But anyway, yes, Lucas Torreira. Um, Just in case you can't use a can and drink like this. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. Buy no. Guinness, yourself a... <laughs> Guinness isn't good out of a can. This but is anyway, how we have to get our sponsorships. I mean, I don't shave my balls, so I can't. we can't get Manscaped <laughs> and... Uh... You know, so we gotta go, we gotta go with Owen's. It's so good. It froths it up. It's 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 amazing. But what I will say is that players are only worth what people are willing to pay. And Lucas Torreira has done Arsenal no favors in 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 the last couple of years, in making it very well known that he's unsettled at Arsenal and that he desires to move on. What I will say is that Fiorentina have been absolute bastards in this process. But can you blame them? As we say. They know that Lucas Torreira wants to leave. They know that Arsenal are willing to sell him. So is it a case of this is Fiorentina turning around and saying, well, we would be absolute idiots to not try to, to scale this price down? So you can't be overly angry at them uh, from a neutral perspective. Um, this could be one of those cases of it being one of the last players that we sort of wipe our hands of and, and move on for free, of which Edu is starting to gain a reputation of doing. I don't see that. I, I I I would be fine with that as long as we don't pay him to leave now. I, I mean, keep him for this season. I don't see him as being a disruptive force in the dressing room. But, like but Mike, when you say keep him for this season, uh, like again, I'm, I know I haven't touched on that yet. But uh, like the Athletic have put out that apparently a certain individual that's linked with Arsenal in, in midfield um, may have to wait for people to be moved on. Do you not think that that midfield um, is? becoming maybe congested and not only that do you not think that that could have an opposite effect of what Mikel Arteta has done well and I think everybody can admit he's done well which has changed the culture of Arsenal you know taking a bad egg into the dressing room I don't think attitude. he's a bad egg I think he's I just, don't think so either I, I think like he's a, just a little forlorn would rather be somewhere else I don't see him as mm-hmm. being a bad egg and I don't think that it, it, it isn't about this isn't a situation like with Mainsley for example where I think if we could sell Maitland Niles for 15 to 20 million, knowing he doesn't want to be at Arsenal, that's fine. Torreira, it, I mean, the price was 12. They didn't pay it. The assumption there then is that we can't get 12 for him anywhere. If that, I mean, if we can get 12 or 15 and he can go to, you know, go to somewhere in Italy that he wants to go or go back to Uruguay, though they're not paying 12 million for anything, um, you know, then, then fine. That's that's probably the best case scenario. That's exactly like if he had stayed at Sampdoria. But if we're going to throw him away for six or seven million, or or loan him out again, then I would absolutely want him there for depth. We've got you know a lot more games than we did last season. We have a lot more injury issues. They're closer together, so we're likely to have even more uh, injury issues, more two a weeks. So yeah, I, I would keep him around. I wouldn't sign him to a contract extension unless it's to protect his value and then sell him. But I, I'd rather see him, uh, rather than selling him for six million pounds or eight million pounds, I'd rather keep him. Jared, do you have an opinion on this before we move yeah, on? Yeah, this is one where you and I agree. You, you never want to see players, you know, mid twenties leave on a free. But there's an exception to every rule, and like Dan said, Thomas Party's proven as good as he is. You know, like they say, the best avail- ability a lot of times is availability. And if he's not there, he's not there. And we need someone to cover that position. And you've got on your team a 26-year-old international player who's a very good holding midfielder that could do a job in that area. So he's one that I would be very against much Brighton, in favor of seeing him stay just to run out the contract. And he's a small egg. He he looks like the body type's the same of Dan Potts if he's in the pool taking a photo, basically. <laughs> except with, what he looks except at, with so. a correctly sized head. <laughs> 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 I mean, if, if you know, the Brighton game last year where Xhaka had to play left back and Sambi Lakonga was left to handle the entire midfield by himself, I mean, would we not have benefited from having Lucas Torreira that day? Uh, I, I mean, so. some, 
benefit to that, I would think. So you know, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of torn. I'm kind of torn between Owen and yourself because I believe personally that we don't want to keep a player that's unhappy at the club, and I agree with Owen also that we're congested in there with not very good players. So if we were congested with quality, I'd be fine. But actually, to have Shaka, El Nini, Lukonga, and Torreira that actually aren't good enough, in my opinion, to take us forward. I think it would be better to try and sell some of those and then put... For me, I'd be getting rid of Chaka. If we're going to get Tielemans and this Fabio Silva, I think we need somebody else in there who's going to be a defensive midfielder and Fabio then say Silva. to Chaka, finally, see you later. Uh, Fabio, who did I say? Vieira, Silva. I meant, sorry. <laughs> who's Fabio Silva? Is he any good? Um, I've not heard of him either. Uh, so, oh, is he the guy who plays Wolves with the hair, like Jake's? Oh, that was a pop <laughs> shot. He said, I haven't heard of him either. Jesus, you sound like everybody yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, there we go, everybody. Why, do you know what I did love though? Throughout the whole of us, Fabio Silva. Uh, yeah, throughout throughout the whole of us talking, Fergus just cared about the Guinness and just said it's amazing. I want one. <laughs> it is. It's great. It's, it's we, we, love, like... we love our Irish listeners. Uh, yeah, Irish that's what I was going to say. say. I thought yeah, that well, was your, uh, your but do you not do you not think going back to Torreira when you look at um, his role, the type of player that he is? I think Lucas Torreira isn't caught out in the Premier League to be a sole six, which is seemingly the system that Mikel Arteta wants to play with either Thomas Partey or eventually maybe Sambi Lukonga coming into that role as well, dividing that between the two of them. I don't think he's Lucas Torreira is cut out for that there. Um, where does he fit in? Because then you have to look at the two attacking eight sort of roles. Does he fit in there? I'm not, I'm not so sure he does. So is it a case of not only is he unhappy, not only is the club willing to move him on, but he doesn't really fit the system anymore either. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a great what, point. Thanks. I don't know Cheers, what it was. <laughs> I was looking at the chat, but Moss has a uh, Moss full of comments today. Has a, a very good one here. Uh, worth more Lucas to another Italian team or Atletico Madrid are interested too. Let's hang on. Rips it at the World Cup and then sell in January. Now by January he'll be able to sign a pre-contract with, you know, Genoa or Crotone or whatever, you know, club uh, doesn't want to pay a transfer fee. But, you know, if he has a good World Cup, you know, you, you, you never know. The, the downside to me in this, the downside to holding on to Kolasinac and Mustafi and Ozil was massive beyond just wages. The downside to holding on to Torreira is very, very minimal in my opinion. It is maybe missing out on six or seven million in transfer fee that you probably wouldn't even get until four years have gone by. And then, and, and having to pay 50, uh, 50 grand a week in his wages, which in, in this day and age is not significant uh, enough to be overly worried about. So to me, I will say, I will say this is Mike as well, Mike, which is another massive positive that I see from this as well. Um, and I just hope that the sort of hold true to this is that, Arsenal of a couple of years past would have buckled to that Fiorentina situation. You know, we wouldn't have ever even heard about this. It simply would have been, oh, Arsenal have parted ways by mutual consent with Lucas Torreira. And and, and it's good to maybe see them start to turn around and just say, do you want to know what? Fuck you. We're not going to be your bitch. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to hold on to our player. And even if it costs us a minimal fee, and like you saying there, would you rather have six or seven million or Lucas Torreira for a season? I, I know I would rather have him for a full season. Yeah. Now, if it was 15, 20 million, the, uh, definitely. Or, or if his wages were, you know, 150, yeah. that would be a different story. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of defensive midfielders, um, Eve Basuma, um, such a like from a from a player standpoint, such a desired, seemingly perfect fit. Although not everybody has agreed with that, you know, over the past couple of seasons that that it's been rumored. Uh, there's a lot of people who have who have said that he might not be, you know, in a partnership, the right type of player. But I do tend to say, from a talent wise, from an experience wise that situation he he's a guy that on the pitch would have approved arsenal to sign and he's an arsenal fan and he's been making you know kissy faces at us for over 12 months now um he's off to that lot up the road and for a pretty reasonable price too 25 million now there is one little situation that might complicate issues a little bit further and you know so so jared to start with you um a do i mean do you would you have wanted us to sign Basuma, all things considered? And B, you know, is it is it just annoying that he went to Spurs as opposed to if he had gone to like Palace or something like that? Or or do you think we missed a trick here? 
I don't think we missed anything. All things considered, I wouldn't have wanted to sign him right now today, given the sort of open-endedness of this legal situation. And I, I may have a little bit different view. I, I don't know if you guys in the UK are NFL fans. Going on right now in the US, there's a predominant footballer, Deshaun Watson, who's league MVP level player. Um, one team just kind of gave a king's ransom to bring him in this summer. He and sat on the bench all last year because his because team of the allegations. Wouldn't, wouldn't play him because he has twenty three, has twenty four people suing him for you know for money, not not criminal charges, but suing him for sexual assault um, in in massages, and um, you know it still hasn't been legally disposed of. The, uh, the 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 lawsuits haven't all gone to court yet. They probably won't for a while. But his team. Couldn't get any, couldn't trade him, didn't want to play him. To their credit, they sat him on the sideline and then he was traded to this team for just ridiculous money. Yeah. I mean, the amount they gave up, obviously, we have draft picks over here that change the game, but it's the equivalent of giving, you know, a hundred million for a player. They gave a massive haul to bring him in. And now I think the total charges are, you know, over 60 that he's facing. And, you know, there's a chance he never plays football again. Now, again, I don't know the details of Eve Basuma's situation. We don't know the severity. I don't know any of the details. So I can't say whether or not that's a, a likely outcome here. Typically not. If you're a celebrity or a professional footballer, you know, things in the legal system tend to tilt your way pretty favorably. So maybe with that in mind, they thought it was a, a reasonable risk. And, you know, if he gets completely cleared of that, you've got a great player at a bargain. Under 30 million for a player like Eve Basuma is a bargain. He's a fantastic footballer. One of the one of the best in the Premier League in his position, in my view. And if it were not for his legal situation, I would have loved to have him at Arsenal. But with all of that hanging over him and not knowing his availability, I would question it. And then also, if you want to be Arsenal and say, we do things the Arsenal way, we do things the right way, we character's important to us, that's something that requires a 100% adherence because you can't take on someone who gets convicted of something like that and still say that it's important to us. Because for all of time, or could, or could get convicted, or everyone is going to cudgel you with that. No matter how much you say we do right things the right way and we're a an upstanding club that should be respected, people are going to beat you with that stick for the next decade that you sign someone who was alleged of this sort of offense and ended up being convicted of it. So there's just a lot of negative that can come out of it, which would have put me off of the deal right now. But there's no question he's a talented footballer, and on footballing terms, I would have loved him. He's he's very good. Yeah. Now, now, so Dan, first of all, we got uh, Mark McCrighton, who I normally find to be a quite reasonable chap, um, pointing out Ronaldo played for Juve and United with a charge hanging over him. Um, Juve, I, I won't comment on, but United, you know, look, United have a reputation and it's not a reputation I would want my club to have. Uh, so that's that, that, you know, that's that. But this is a more common discussion in the, in the media and in, in, in social media, I should say. Spurs lawyers would know enough. They must know enough. They must have some sort of insight into his, you know, I, I don't doubt that they've talked to the player and his representatives and his attorney, but I don't know that they're getting inside information from, uh, from, from police or from barristers and, and, um, and, and solicitors and judges and stuff to, to, to make, I, I think that they have taken a risk here. It might be a calculated risk, but I think that there it, it's more than a zero risk. And I just, I don't believe the whole thing of, oh, they wouldn't have spent the money if they, if they thought it was right. Cause you could flip that around and say Brighton wouldn't have sold him for so little if they knew he was innocent as well. So Dan, your, your thoughts on the entirety of the, uh, of the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, the player is a player that I wanted. Uh, Bissouma and Tiedemans were two players I really wanted in center midfield. I really like everything that Bissouma represents I think he epitomizes what we need in the Arsenal midfield I think he's aggressive I think he's a great uh, footballer technically on the ball as well and I think he's just got the attributes that I feel we've been lacking in the Arsenal midfield for many years so he's a player that I really like it hasn't annoyed me just because he's gone to Spurs it actually would have annoyed me if he would have gone for 25 million to anybody because that is an absolute steal as far as I'm concerned I know he's got one year left and he's got all this stuff up in the air and I'll come on to that in a minute but I actually believe that as a footballer to get somebody of that quality for 25 million you just have to do it it's great business it's smart business and it's it's a fantastic signing I think he's going to upgrade Tottenham's midfield, albeit it won't be difficult because it's only got Hoiberg in it, really, because Ben Sankur, as much as I like, I think Bissouma and Ben Sankur is an upgrade. Um, and he would have upgraded many sides, to be honest with you. 
Where I'm confused is why nobody else went into this guy, which is why I think we come on to the next bit about his personal uh, side of things, because Arsenal weren't interested from what we're being told. But neither, I don't think, were Villa. There was rumours that they would have put a bid in. They never did. Newcastle, that would have been a perfect signing for them. Him and Bruno Gamara's in the middle. They never went for him. So players, teams that had money, sorry, never went. Manchester United, surely they would have been. I mean, they've got McFred in their midfield. Do you know what I mean? So for me, you'd like to think that they would be happy with somebody like him, but they didn't go for him either. So there's something that stinks here, and I don't quite know what it is. Now, I would imagine Tottenham have done their research as to what this is all about. But like you rightly say, how much do they know? Because I don't know anything about this. Now, this guy could just walk and be fine, and it could be done and dusted. And from what I'm hearing, it's not looking like there's going to be anything that happens and it'll be a Tottenham player and it'll be a great signing. But you just never know. So that's the only thing I can see as to why not everybody's gone in for this guy. Because if he was up for sale and put in a transfer request... I would be amazed if five or six clubs didn't go in for him because I honestly don't feel like there's many defensive midfielders as good as him in the league that aren't of the quality of somebody like Declan Rice or Rodri. Like, I honestly stinks, believe he's, the, he's that good. Something stinks then about that, Ben. I mean, like, the, I mean, like you said, it, there's there's got to be a reason why, as far as why, why he went for so low and he went to one team. Tottenham says we're in. We don't mind what's going on. We're okay with it. We're, we're going to give you $25 million. Why wouldn't Brighton go around and say, okay, well, who else wants wants you know Basuma for twenty five? Yeah, 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 exactly. Thirty yeah, million. Yeah. And, and, Do you know what and, it might be, Mike? It might be that Conte Conte knows that Basuma is going to go down in the next year, so Conte will be off by then. So he's just coming and do well, one season with us, and that's Dan, it. Dan, does know? that not go with what I was telling you on November first when he was hired? Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Is yeah. That he, does, yeah. He, his his focus is on the next nine to twelve months. It was it's a desperate move to hire him in the first place. I still think that, even though they seem to be backing him. And, I, you know, it's not about his ability to coach. He is one of the best coaches, if not the best in the world, but maybe other than Pep and Klopp. But he, it's, it was a desperation move that I think will, will blow up in their faces. I think this move for Basuma could very well turn into a desperation move that's going to blow up in their faces. And, you know, and and it's it's – I don't think that they've completely thought things through. I would bet, Owen, that they have a clause in his contract that takes care – of Tottenham as it relates to wages, if he should be, you know, like I mean, like a morality clause or something to where they can basically wipe their hands of him, but that doesn't save him a twenty-five million in transfer fee. Um, I've heard this theory. Uh, I put up. I'm not sure whether you've seen it. It was, uh, you know, how I like my analogy and hypothetical situations, and I put up a poll on Twitter the day that he was rumored to be signing, which was that if I was to go. Yeah, out yeah, looking to buy a house but the house that i was looking at was awaiting um a survey inspection to see if there was structural damage to the foundations would you still pay up front for the house i think about 90 percent of the votes were no absolutely not my favorite and, part of that though was that you, you you slow played it perfectly because people were like well how much does the house cost and you were like eh, but what was your answer of about 25 million <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I actually yeah, but, didn't get, I didn't get it at first. I was like, you know, I just know that you, everything you, another house? Everything you do has to do with construction. All of your analogies have to do with construction. So I was like, oh, here comes another one. And you know, and you've moved three times in the last two months. So I'm like, oh god, is he moving again? And then when you said 25 million, I was like, oh, that was brilliant. No, no, no. It's a, uh, it's the whole point of you think of an investment, it, and exactly in that situation, let's say the house is 120 thousand pound. Like that's still a lump of an investment. Now you look at twenty five million pound, especially in today. And I don't want to get political with this, but we all know how seriously those types of allegations are treated in modern day society. You know, you look at some of the high profile um, cases being uh, put on the news now. It, it, it's just it, it's too dangerous of a situation to dip your foot into voluntarily. And I myself, if I'm being completely honest i don't think that there is this clause that that relieves tottenham of any duty of paying for his wages because if you're any kind of an agent you're not entering into any type of deal like that there we've seen this player horn himself well, out he, doesn't, he doesn't have that with brighton so you'd almost rather him just stay at brighton if that was if that yeah, was, yeah, right, it, right, yeah to be honest with you i think that he's obviously an absolutely unbelievable player as well but the situation for me there, it's just too, it's too rocky of a road to be walking down. Like you say, with the reputation that Arsenal has for that sort of class, it's it's uh, 
no, not for well, me. And and you know, it, not that this matters to most people, and and ultimately it doesn't it doesn't put trophies or keep trophies from being in the in the trophy cabinet. But um, you know, who needs an opening day picketing or protest from women's rights groups uh, in the news and in social media against your club because of bringing on a player? You know, if someone had signed Mason Greenwood, uh, is that his name? Uh, yep. I mm-hmm. I've, forgotten, I've forgotten his name since he fell off the, end, uh, the the face of the earth. But like, you know, if someone had signed him, or if England had called him mm-hmm. up, I mean, believe me, the blowback would have been massive. So I, I think people are just going a bit nuts on on this uh, this situation. And, and just just so you know, the Telemans thing is apparently true. That so. that guy reporting that. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it, so we'll, that's a bit strange for me. I, I don't know why we would pull out of that. They're saying he's going to sign a one year deal at Leicester. Why would he do that? I don't get it. I hope that's nonsense, man, because I'd love him. I think he'd be brilliant for Arsenal. I really do. But um, we'll see. We'll yeah. see how that plays out. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of negotiating mm. tactics that can be used in a lot of different ways. But uh, but mm. you know, I I had seen just just in enough re- reports saying that the one had nothing to do with the other. But mm-hmm. a lot of rumors flying around right now. And I, I think if the first week of the transfer windows taught us anything, it's that we need to just kind of like let things play out a little bit rather than, you know, overreacting to every single piece of news that comes in. And, and, you know, so being excited about Telemans coming in on top of uh, Vieira, you know, I'm, I'm going to put that on hold as much as I am putting on hold being worried now that we've decided on this kid and now we're not in for Telemans. So, and when we were in Leicester, not, not when we were in Leicester, Dan, but when my son and I were in Leicester in April, um, we overheard a lot of people talking about Telemans and the fact that they would, be happy to see him go. Um, so, you know, I'm not much of a tactical analyst of players. I don't, I kind of buy into what everyone else is saying when it comes to that, but uh, very few players do I have a strong opinion on. Telemans is not one of them, but, but Lester doesn't seem overly enamored with the guy. So I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm a little wonder, uh, wondering why we think that he'll be so good for us, but uh, we I watched a one. lot of him and him and Madison just quickly. I watched a lot of him and Madison last year because we were linked with both of them. And I, I actually really liked, wanted Madison. I really liked him. And uh, 16 goals and 12 assists later, you can see why I wanted him. But I feel like with Tielemans, I watched him because I didn't know much about him as much as I did Madison. Because I hadn't really watched him. I just heard that he was a half-decent player. And I actually really liked Tielemans. I think he does a lot of defensive work at a lot of the time that people see Tielemans. It's a lot of what he does moving forward. But I'm a huge fan of him as a as an all-round midfielder. And I think he'd be a massive upgrade on Granite Xhaka, albeit not difficult, uh, as a number eight. So uh, I would be really happy with Tielemans. I would have. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on the side of I would love to have him here just because most people who I know who have opinions I respect uh, have said that. So uh, <laughs> Mark now redeeming himself with me by saying we've lost interest in Tielemans because the charges on Basuma have been dropped and we've just offered Spurs 60 million pounds for, for Basuma. <laughs> that would be that would be classic Arsenal. Um, and, and, and you know, one of the things that, that Ken Kuhn Reese says is, is sort of reminds me of Victor Wanyama, and I think he means the situation where we kind of we were rumored to take him and then didn't what it reminds me of. And this all another Southampton midfielder who at a time where we were so bereft of a number six and we hadn't had anyone so long and Morgan Schneiderlin was available. And, and, and that summer, I remember, I just, you know, every once in a while, something just gets into my head and, and I just go crazy over it. It, it. It's happened with Manchi. It's happened with Balogun. Like, like all of a sudden, I'm just like, you know, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to Arsenal if we do this. And, um, you know, it's usually just a joke for me. But, like, Schneider and I was like, he just seems like the perfect, perfect fit. And it's almost laughable now looking back at what happened to Schneider in his career after he transferred to United. <laughs> Um, but like th- it reminds me more of the Schneiderlin situation than than the Wanyama situation. Maybe his style of play is more like Victor Wanyama. But even Victor Wanyama went to Spurs, and and I and, and I hated to see him go there because I had a lot of love and respect for the guy. Uh, but his career didn't quite work out there either, did it? Uh, Might have had one or one and a half good seasons there. So uh, mm-hmm. that's a good comment from Ken Can Reed. It, it does remind me that. So. We got to speed through the rest of the week here. Uh, Wednesday, the only major thing that happened on Wednesday, I mean, and it was a major, major thing, was this. Now, if you if you don't know this little guy, he is the biggest Twitter superstar in the history of Arsenal. 
um, bigger than than Thierry Henry, bigger than uh, even Lee Judges. It, it's amazing, and and um, and he did it again. The son of a bitch did it again. Uh, he had a piece of news that, that that came out, and in fact, he even had two pieces of news that came out because w- when he was on our podcast on Thursday morning, four thirty a.m. Eastern time, nine thirty a.m. doing the, uh, the the fixture release. He broke another piece of news, which is that the Amazon documentary premiere is going to take place three days before the season starts. So quick, just 10 second response. Do you, are you thrilled about the Amazon documentary coming out? And if, and, and either way, would you have preferred that it be over the summer rather than kind of basically overshadow and overlay the first half of our season? Oh, and start with you. Um. I'm neither here nor there, if I'm being honest with you. It, it, it is what it is in a sense of that <clears throat> there's no way that a football club like Arsenal are signing off on something like this without some form of creative control. And I think it was very plain to see in the Spurs one, as funny as it was to watch, it was hilarious. But uh, that a lot of it seems staged, especially with the whole Jose Mourinho factor. Now, I hope that ours isn't that. I hope it is a genuine peek behind the curtain. And, of course, it's going to interest me as an Arsenal fan that you want to see him behind the curtain. And and the... Jesus, right. <laughs> That's some great insight right there. Thanks very much. Um, but, look, what, yeah, it would have been good to fill the gap between the summer. I suppose it's all going to... It's all going to boil down to how we start the season. If we start the season miserably, then people are going to be talking so much shit about this Amazon documentary and the effect that it had on the club. If we started well, I suppose people would be well up for it. So another big thing as well, I think, going into this is the business we do during the summer. That's often the most entertaining part is uh, seeing the new arrivals come into the club. They often delve quite deep into that. So look, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm all into that sort of shit. You know, I, I obviously had we finished fourth, it would have been something I would have absolutely looked forward to watching every minute of because I knew it wouldn't be a bad reminder of something. Given that we the way and the way we missed out on top four, um, you know, it is going to have kind of an unhappy ending. Let's let's put it that way. But it would be funny if they should just end it before the final three games and just act like that's when the season would have ended and be like show the show the like the Premier League table through thirty five weeks, but. Um, but, you know, I'll be interested to watch it from a lot of different perspectives, you know, for like, what will they show? How will they couch it? What really happened with a lot of the transfers? Because we did do a lot of business last summer, you know, and, and so it won't be like, you know, doing a documentary of the summer that we only signed Petr Cech. So uh, I think it'll be interesting. And the added thing of it being kind of aired while we're playing the first half of our season, Jared, is is that it brings in the dynamic that Owen just mentioned where how we feel about it and how it's perceived is going to be heavily influenced by whether we're playing well or playing not well as it's being aired, which is bizarre. Yeah. And and I'm kind of with Owen. I wish it came out earlier in the summer, you know, a July release, you know, kind of bridges that gap. We don't have the world cup this summer. So it'd be nice to have something football related to watch. In general, I love sports documentaries. Regardless, I'm going to watch it. I've watched the Man City one. I've watched the Spurs one. I've watched the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team one. I don't even watch hockey. I just the love Leeds the, and Sunderland ones were great as well. They're, the Le- yeah, those two are fantastic. But I, I'm a big fan of the show, so I'll definitely watch it. As far as it coming out right before the season, I, I wish it was a little bit earlier, but that's probably just part of the PR team to get it rolling in. And and I does hope I, I do hope they add some things from the guys we signed this summer to the beginning of it, whether they will or not, I don't know. But more than anything, I, I hope it's not too staged. Obviously, you know, they've got a lot of Arsenal's gonna have a lot of discretion over what gets included in there. But I, I hope we do see some of the behind the scenes. I want to see some of the arts at a team talks. I want to see those halftime conversations. Uh, because a lot of us watch games and say, you know, I'd like to see X, Y, and Z happen in the second half. I want this said to this player. It'll be interesting to see his style because he's very diminutive with the press and kind of soft-spoken. I- I'm curious to see if that carries over or if he's a little bit more fiery, you know, in the dressing room, especially mid-game and kind of how he talks about adjustments and what he wants to see. That's kind of the part that's most interesting to me is to get a better look at the way Arteta manages the team. Yeah, and and um, and I've just decided on behalf of the po- uh, Gunners podcast that we're going to do game live 
either live or directly after uh you know reaction shows to amazon all or nothing so um I so, thought you were going to say we were doing the next season of All or Nothing, the Gooners Pod. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, <laughs> yeah. Well, cameras follow me around wherever I go. I don't know about you guys, but because you're holding it. Yeah. So, Dan, I mean, is there anything you're looking forward to and seeing uh, in this other than pictures of the players showering after the game? Uh, apart from that, man. Uh, uh, listen, I didn't watch Man City one. I didn't watch Spurs. Uh, I watched Sunderland until I die, and I enjoyed it actually. Um, but All or Nothing. I know how it ends. Nothing. So I don't think I'll watch it. Uh, if I'm honest with you, it'll just wind me up. If I, uh, Listen, I'm going to watch it. Oh, no, of course I am. But it will just wind me up. And um, I think... No, man, I'm, interest... I'm, I'm done, man. No, I'm done. I'm going to be done. 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 Tapped I mean, out. Millions done. of people still went to see Titanic when it came out. So I'm sure people will watch Y'all or Nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good analogy, you know. That is a really good analogy. What happens? What happens? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a bit like uh, watching Prison Break and then thinking, "What's going to happen?" Dude, um, if, yeah, if, I, I, yeah, if, I listen. If, I, if the Titanic had sunk just outside the top of the water rather than all the way to the bottom, <laughs> then, then, then I think it would have been a great ending. So, <laughs> I, I personally feel like everybody will uh, Arsenal fan will watch it, even if they don't want to admit it. But um, I don't know what we're expecting to find. If I'm honest, maybe some inside knowledge about players and relationships and what Arteta is actually like in the dressing room. I suppose. I tell you can, what, can I can I ask Dan this here, right, Dan? Because you're let me just let me just say this and then go back to you. What Arsenal will find, what we will find, is agendas, and not just on one side. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. We're going to see agendas. We're going to be what seeing people use what was aired to either say I was right about this or this is too staged. I mean, it's it, it it's not going to bring the club together. It's not going to bring the the fan base together. It's going to do the opposite. That's that's what I worried about from the beginning, and I think that's what's going to happen. But oh, and back to you. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, just for uh, Dan, obviously, what's the play with him? You're a negative cunt. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just fucking. I thought no. we said we weren't going to talk about what we say in the group. In, he in knows somebody group. fucking around. <laughs> um, no, but the one thing I will say is that the, the, the my biggest takeaway from love that. From... <laughs> Sorry, bro. No, you're, my cool, biggest, man, you're cool. My biggest takeaway from this season was that the atmosphere around Arsenal has changed. I think. In, in like fucking years, I mean, since, mm-hmm. since like I was a kid that long, long ago, um, yeah. the atmosphere has changed in the stadium around the Arsenal fan base. There is undoubtedly a togetherness that Mikel Arteta has been influential, I think, in changing the characters. Characters he's brought in, you know, the likes of Aaron Ramsey and Ben White, you know, that shithousery stuff coming back and uh, sort of fuck you us against them mentality that we start to have now. And I know that you're quite critical of the ownership and Arteta to a certain extent and stuff like that. But where do you stand? Is you have to be feeling better as an Arsenal fan now than you did, say, three, four years ago? Surely, are you? So I totally agree that the atmosphere is better in terms of a connect with the players. But I haven't enjoyed the last three years as an Arsenal fan because of how poor we've been. Eighth, eighth, and fifth um, is not grand to me. Um, so that's why I haven't enjoyed it. However, I do take your point that when we go to the games, um, there is more of a togetherness and a connect with the fans. 100%. That, that can't be denied, whether you love or hate what's happening at the club. Um, I think, <laughs> don't call me Shirley. I think, um, that, uh, it's definitely 100%. Um, I, I agree with you and, and what you've said. And I do think that what Mikel Arteta has done, um, or has just tried to do at least, has all been for the right reasons. Like it's all come do, from do, a good do you place. Think that, you know here's, I mean? a better, here's a better question. Mm. Do you think that if Mikel Arteta was a football director, that he would be doing a very good job? <laughs> That's a great point, you know. That is a great point because most of the time, over the last two years, that I've been questioned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe they swap roles, yeah. But yeah, I, I do feel like... Into a bowl of the dirty bastards. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I have said, to be fair, that the, the last two years... Off the pitch, I've been a lot, a lot more um, positive, and I've given them a lot more praise. On the pitch, I think it's been really poor at times. But actually, off the pitch, um, 
removing the culture. I know it's not hard to do. I mean, everybody knew to get rid of Mustafi Kolasinac and Ozil and you might be doing the right thing. But he did it. Had to take somebody to do it. Um, and that is definitely a positive. So I think you might be right. You know, if you wanted the fan connect, if you wanted to have the, the crowd listen to with some of the songs that we've seen and that guy, I can't remember his name now, the North London Forever stuff. I think you're right. Yeah, off the pitch, we're seeing some good things. But I wouldn't mind some results on it, mate. And um, maybe I'll start giving him some praise next season. We'll never know. Will this guy start giving him some praise now? <laughs> I never know with him, man. He's the biggest flip flop I know. Bless him. Um, one time he loves him, next time he hates him. But uh, and, and you know what? I, I I think that's the way it should be, man. I that, I think that's why he's he's universally beloved by everyone other than barbers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a fucking clinker. Um, but do you want to know why? Here's one thing that I'll say is that is that this season above all and. Use two boys in the group chat kind of tone of this year as well is that I've made a, a big, big, big effort to sort of step back from nitpicking every situation that Arsenal do, you know, whether it's transfers or contracts or, or people's wages. And, and the example I give is that when I was watching football as a kid, I never knew how much Thierry Henry was earning a week and I never knew how much Gilberto was earning a week. And I didn't give a shit about who owned the club or who did this. And it was just down to just go out and support the club at the weekend, and it has made me much, much, much more happy. And, well, this... and, that, was, and that was my only point, Dan, when when my daughter and I were over for, well, when I was over and my daughter was also there, which she still is, uh, for that last game of the season. And, and I mean, what a fun day in the midst mm. of a shit week. Like, 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 it can be that. I had, on that Sunday, May, what was it, 22nd? I had one of the best days of my life. I, I shared the arsenal with my daughter and her friend. I I saw all of my mates. We had a great time before the game. We had a great time after the game. We won five one against a, an awful Everton team. Um, you know, the, the social. To be honest, Mike, the social has got most really, people through. I spilled, I spilled this, wine this all over your mother. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, Jared Camden Yuri on his honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was. To, I traveled to Northern Ireland to watch the North London Derby with with Owen. I mean, so, I'll be doing that still again. a great night. Talk about enjoying something in spite of the product on the pitch. If ever there was an example, that was it because it was but, one of the worst ninety I, minutes I I've they, ever had to sit through. But I had to and grab. I, I had to grab the microphone out of Lee's hand when he was doing the, the you know the uncensored on Lee Judge's podcast because I'm like I'm like there's there's so much negativity going on right now. And I, I, I accept and appreciate and respect all of your opinions about the, about the, the thing in general. But at the end, I, I just, I had to get this in. I said, we just beat a team five, one at home. Can we have a second to enjoy it? Like, like, like in, in this moment, can we be happy? And, and I will say as well, Mike, I think the home and away support this year has been the best I've seen in a long, 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 long time. Amazing. Like, Unbelievably good, and I know you've been to some games, Mike, and I've gone to. Well, our Leicester know, away experience every... was amazing, and then and then I know it was it was Leicester was superb. Uh, ways, like Villa, Villa was <laughs> Villa was superb away. Um, great away day there in the sunshine. You, you and Fergus ended up uh, having ninety-seven thousand beers, and uh, what was it? Yeah, was it? we had or? we had a load of beers in Leeds, and then decided oh, to really? do a, a podcast. Um, <laughs> so it was it was class, and um, uh, and, and I've had some great at home and away days. But if I'm honest, the social got us through it because there were some horrendous away days and home home games as well um particularly the brighton southampton and palace stint, and there's, that and there's was a really hard and there is a difference well and yeah and i was at the i was at the lowest of the lows and one of the and some mm. of the highest of the highs and and um and and it's not good uh but as mark says were your emotions not overcome with a sense of missed opportunity they were overcome with a sense of missed opportunity starting on monday when we lost to newcastle by sunday my emotions were overcome with alcohol. enjoying the moment with alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By Sunday, they were overcome with other things about enjoying the day, making the best out of it, knowing that there was still a, you know, a, a half of a percent chance that this could end up being one of the greatest days of all time, but not expecting it to happen. So, you know, the missed opportunity, we had, we had six days to bake all that in. It wasn't like, you know, we were in fourth and we lost fourth on the Sunday, in which case, you know, or because we didn't win by enough or something like, like it was already done and over with by that point. So I spent the week being upset about it. And then Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I had three of the best days of my arsenal life. And um, then, see, can I, can I just ask, and I'm sorry to just keep throwing questions to Dan, but it's just because I wouldn't say I'm as positive as these two 
these two. Oh, he's the, he's the band parts of our podcast. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. But what I will say is that I feel uh, sorry for you, Owen. Feel sorry for you. Yeah, yeah. Everybody does. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but I'm coming so, over to spill some wine on his with, with, with with this process thing, don't take up any pictures of my mother again. Okay, she's featured in the interview. That's as much as your license for that picture is paid for. <laughs> so with this process, you know, the plan that, that they have put in place of invest in youth and then sprinkle <laughs> fuck's sake. I was gonna say sprinkle world class talent. Now that sounds fucked up. But <laughs> sprinkle world class talent throughout the squad. When you look at the players that we brought in last year, the players that are graduating from the academy and the players that are now being linked with and not that maybe you want to dive in too deep to any of them, but the likes of Gabriel Jesus, Telemans, Martinez at the back, um her uh, Vieira coming in uh, as well. Do you think that these are enough to excite you for next season? Uh, like, like I myself think next season with this level of uh, level of investment, there's no excuse top four or or bust for me with this level oh, yeah. of investment. Mm-hmm. But does it excite you for next season? Or are you going and thinking, oh Jesus, not not another year of this? So without being too pessimistic, because I haven't come on here to moan, um, I don't feel personally like. Um, I will be excited because I quite liked last summer's transfers and I was quite open and honest about that to start with. I didn't um, love the Erdegaard signing because I would have preferred Madison, but I didn't hate it. I thought he was a good player. Um, ben White, I thought was a lot of money, but from what I was hearing, it was good things. Tommy Asu I'd never heard of, but it was a position we needed and he came in was brilliant. Ramsdale, I wasn't too sure, but I certainly didn't slate him like some people did before he'd even put on the shirt. And all of those kind of come to fruition. Now, there was a couple that didn't work. I didn't see that Lekonga and Tavares were going to be needed as much as perhaps they were. And I, did, I think they were probably two of the weaker ones. But when you look at the players we're, we're, we're linked with now, it is definitely positions that we need again. So, I again, like you say, Arteta's doing his off-the-field stuff well with, with Edu in terms of positions that we need, but I just don't feel the manager is good enough or at that elite standard to get us where we want to be with a good side. Um, and I what think it's per, proved... What about the personnel, though? The, the actual... They're good enough. Quality. They're good enough. Yeah. They're good enough. And they were last year for top four, in my opinion. Um, but the manager wasn't, and I think that proved at the end. With Tuchel and Conte, I think it proved that you need an elite manager. You don't actually need an elite team, because that Chelsea side was going nowhere. I think it was ninth at one stage, and then it won the Champions League. And obviously, Conte, under nu- uh, Spurs under Nuno, you know, people will say they're only a couple of points um, off of Arsenal. Yeah, but how poor were both sides at that time of the year? We just lost the first three games of the season. So... We were really playing catch up as well, and then obviously he's come in. I think Spurs would have probably finished eighth or ninth under Nuno. They were that poor, but with Conte, he's come in with one window and two players and got them into the top four. And that to me just proves that's why we need an elite manager. And you know, I've got no doubt that Arteta will be a good manager one day. I've got absolutely no doubt about that because there's there's he's always going to progress and he's always going to get better every year and he's young enough to, to improve. But actually at the moment, which, which that's not what I don't think when, when that happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, which so, <laughs> you know, so, so that, that, that's my honest opinion of it. And I've been quite clear with that. And what I will say, and I'd like to say, I'd like to stress this actually is I'm no longer going for Mikel Arteta. I'm going for Stan Kroenke either way. And the reason I'm going for Stan Kroenke is if he backs this guy, then people will say, you can't go for Kroenke. That's cool. If he backs him, that's absolutely fine. But I can come for Kroenke if it starts going wrong and he's not doing anything about it. That is where I can come for Kroenke. I can come for Kroenke if he doesn't back this guy because if he thinks that he can't get into the top four without backing and he doesn't back him again with this squad, then, we, yeah, I'll be coming for Kroenke. So I think when it comes to it, I've got more hatred towards the process because of Stan Kroenke than I have for Mikel Arteta. And I think looking back, I've been so angry and annoyed with Mikel Arteta because of his on-the-pitch stuff, when really I think most of the blame comes from ahead because who put this guy in charge? Like, let's be honest, who put this guy in charge? Nobody. I don't know any Arsenal fan that wanted Mikel Arteta. I'd yet to meet one. Um, well, having said that, I don't really understand the fan protection. Um, that's something I'm, I, no one can answer. Maybe someone on here or in the chat can answer me why the guy gets so much love and, and protection. Um, maybe it's something that... Uh, <laughs> I love that. Uh, and it's true as well. Uh, but I, I, I do feel maybe someone can tell me why why Arsene Wenger and Unai Emery managed to get higher positions and got slated when Mikel Arteta has got poor um, positions and then is absolutely loved. Mike's I don't really know the reason like a, for that. Mike is like a fucking slingshot. Go, go. Uh, no, no, I, no, wants to get in. Wants it, to get in. It, it's well because I think that there's two different classifications of of people that that 
and I'm I'm definitely in one of these camps. The camp I'm in is I don't want to start over again. I I don't look at the the person specifically as being faulty. I'm I'm looking at the entire thing and I'm willing to give it a little bit of time because I see us heading in the right direction. The other element, which I think is the smaller of the two, but probably the more vocal, are the people who are just absolutely tied to this person. Same as people were with Ozil, same as people were with Wenger, same as people have become sometimes with Emery uh, but, and, and Aubameyang. I'm not, I couldn't give two shits about Mikel Arteta. I don't care about Mikel Arteta other than the fact that he holds a position in my life right now that I find more important than, than most that don't have anything to do with my family. And that is the guy who's essentially influencing the club that I love and how we perform over the next, hopefully many, many years. So my support of him is support of the idea that, that, that he is putting his efforts towards improving the situation for the club. <laughs> That's funny. Front and that is hilarious. Josh asked us last year to be excited. By the way, it was three years ago. Uh, this year, Dan Poda uh, said, uh, "Stand, be afraid." So next week, we will actually have Dan Poda on to to answer to those. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know who that is? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know who it is, but we're going to get him on. Uh, Maybe so, it's my like, my Polish brother or something. I don't know. But <laughs> so I, I wanted to distinguish between people who support Mikel Arteta and who and people who support the manager of Arsenal Football Club. I support the manager of Arsenal Football Club, and I'm not saying that in the snarky way that it's normally meant to say you don't support Arsenal Football Club. Or you, I support the person in that position. If they sacked him tomorrow, I would be fine with that as long as I saw a con continuity plan that brought someone in that wasn't going to result in us taking four more steps back to take four more steps forward. And I you think know, it, the way you've explained that is is really is really good. To be fair, Mike, in terms of how you feel, but I feel like. The question was more. You, you've said you'll support the manager. You'll support the manager. Blah blah blah. And because he's the manager, and, and it doesn't mean I will never question the manager. But I don't think that it's absolutely. And that's why I'm. That's why I'm saying that you're not in this category because there are some that will just. I mean, like Ben White, fifty million. Oh, is that a bit much? Oh, praise the Lord! What a signing! And it's all like, <laughs> hang on a minute. Like we don't know what he's going to do yet. You know what I mean? Like he might be awful. Um, and it's just this loving session. I don't quite understand. And um, you dare question his tactics. You dare question his like. It, we didn't get anyone in January. It's really disappointing. App, but it's better than buying someone we didn't want. It's always something to come back at. And um, I think next season it'll be interesting if we don't get top four where these people disappear to because I believe they'll go silent. And, um, yeah, it'll be interesting because well, well people, have, people yeah. have received a lot of abuse. People Just quickly, people have received a lot of abuse from the people that love Arteta, from the people that don't. And I think that sometimes people like myself, I've received a hell of a lot of abuse, but unfortunately this what you get in this game. But I've received a lot of abuse about... Um, about slagging off the manager, and sometimes I've gone over the top. To be fair, and and I have yeah, been uh, tongue in cheek you know, a lot of the time. As someone that knows you, like a lot of the time, yeah, of course, tactic, of course, man. of course, and, and and I feel like sometimes over text or tweet, people will read it wrong or whatever, and have a go at you. So that's fair play. But I I actually do feel that this been to the others as well. So people that I mean, some are listening, some of you are on here. You've also received a lot of stuff which you think is harsh because you, oh, how can you accept this mediocrity? How can you have it? And I've I've said that. <laughs> Because it frustrates the hell out of me when people say I'm happy with a top six finish. I think it's a great season. That frustrates me because I've just completely disagree with that. Um, and I think we all want to be on one page. And I get frustrated when I'm not. I'm hurting, and everyone else is like, "What a season!" Like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I think, why do you think that's a great season? Coming sixth. Oh, sorry, coming fifth. Sorry. Oh, how dare I? Um, so you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I think. Uh, I think personally, you didn't even, you didn't even watch the, the team, and you don't know what the finish. Is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 Come yeah. On, See, so I, I, you know, I, I, I think. I think as somebody, I think bang central between say the likes of. Jared, who's a positive cunt, and, and yourself, Dan, who's a negative cunt, and, and me, it's central. It's, <laughs> oh, it's, oh, yeah, you're central. Okay. Oh, yeah, central. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More on high ground here, bro. Um, <laughs> I, I always think that when I look, uh, look, there's been times uh, the running towards the boxing death fixtures last season before the Emil Smith Road breakthrough was, I was calling for our tethered head at that stage. The loss after Villarreal, I was calling for our tethered head at that stage as well. There's been multiple times that I, have definitely doubted him and his position. But what I will say is that 
what I do have is some sort of sense of understanding of who Mikel Arteta is and, and, and what this, for lack of a better term, process is, which is that this is, a, a, a like you said, a, a completely inexperienced manager, not only an inexperienced manager, an inexperienced uh, director of football, an inexperienced uh, Vene, uh, you know, CEO, whatever the fuck you want to call him. It's a really inexperienced backroom staff. And what I do have sympathy for is making mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes in life. We've all done it in our jobs. And if everybody had their head cut off, except for you, Mike, because you've got that Jewish superpower, which is like, yeah. (laughs) But if we all lost our jobs at the first mistake we ever done, nobody would be in employment. But what what I can't get is repeated mistakes and um, what i will say is yes. that i was i was as i was just as fuming as you in january because that was a completely missed opportunity putting faith in a player in eddie and Kadia, i think who was had proven himself not to be up to the standard that we needed to get ourselves across the line and to an extent i still think that even though he done quite well in the last run of the season but it's when those mistakes start repeating themselves and for me they haven't done that just yet you know that that I'm willing to give it a go until the point where I say you're making the same stupid mistakes again. Yep. And for me, that's, uh, that's fair. That's fair. And for me, and for me, that is this season. We heard, as I mentioned earlier, the process was invest in youth, promote youth, and then sprinkle world class talent. From what I see now, they're going for proven equities in Gabriel Martinelli, uh, Gabriel Martinelli, Gabriel Jesus. You have to be Gabriel to play for Arsenal. Uh, Yuri Tielemans. Uh, you know they're going for proven players now. And as I mentioned earlier, it's now a bust for me because if if we hit the end of this year, regardless of how well or how poor poor anybody else does in in this season, in this season, it's in our hands now with this amount of investment. And I'm not sure that I agree that you can blame the Cronkies for keeping Mikel Arteta in a position for all this time. But one thing I don't think you can call into question is the level of money that they've made available to Arsenal. Um, over the last few transfer windows. Well, and we'll be talking about that. In, we, we're, we're almost set for a I, – I've, I've been promising it to the Arsenal Lounge uh, because Mo, Mo and I got into a bit of a discussion about, about – oh, I heard about this. I was on the lounge last week and they said, do you want to come on with Mo and Mike and talk figures? And I just said, nope. Look, I, I will attest that, that this week. He may, he may look super stupid, but he's actually really good with that numbers thing. No, he is. Yeah, you. Uh, well, you yeah, but I don't. Know. completely but stupid. Mo is a, <laughs> and I'm not. I'm dyslexic with numbers. So Mo, uh, Mo's an accountant though, so I, he's he's a tough one, and it's not going to be a battle. It's going to, but 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 I've been I've been knee deep in spreadsheets. I've been balls deep in spreadsheets, uh, uh, and um, <laughs> and and it is. You know, so so there's a, again. I, I look at apparently he's he's got some good from according to Sheen though he told me that he's got some good evidences to suggest that Crocky hasn't invested much money and I'm not sh- quite sure how he's going to work that out but it'd be interesting to watch I think. Well, because they uh, get too it, wrapped it up in where the money comes it, from. It we get way too wrapped up in where it comes yeah. from. When someone says, "Did they put in? If they put in 200 million of their own money, people would say, hey, they're doing a great job.' If they mm-hmm. move money around to say 200 million is available to you." that's not out of their own pocket, people are critical of them. As a fan, I don't really care where it comes from. The money that's going into the team is the same. How they kind of work not, it on their end isn't my primary concern when it comes yeah. to the transfer window. Not to get too far into it, but like there, there's a lot of different ways to put money into a club. There's there's mm-hmm. equity, there's debt, there's refinancing external debt into internal debt, and a lot of it has to do with how and when or if you get paid back. And so, you know, I mean, you could, Everton's put a ton of money into the club, but the reason that they've done it is to cover losses. So, you know, losses that were done by, do, by dumb decisions. So, and, th- and then it's not just about money. It's about having the right people in the place to make the right decisions. And that mm-hmm. is where Kroenke and KAC have absolutely failed in contrast to a club like Liverpool. So not going to get into that today, but, uh, and I don't even remember why I brought that up now. because what, what day are we on? Are we, are we on Tuesday still? <laughs> yeah, no, we're... <laughs> We've got one thing left to discuss, and in fact, uh, it, it, it there's a little bit of a financial component to it. And a few minutes ago, there was a uh, there was a transition. But before that, Owen, I owe you I, I owe you something because I did put your mother up. I'm now going to put a picture of my mother up. From- oh, is that a that's some obscure action from Mrs. Feinberg? Wow. this oh, is uh, oh, she wasn't Mrs. Feinberg then. 
Um, <laughs> this this was uh, from 1993 in uh, on the same Greek island that my daughter is currently uh, lounging on. Where is she? Santorini right now. Oh, yeah. I um, live just across from Santorini. So this is a 43-year-old uh, Magic Mike's mother right here. So um, Dying pace. We're gonna, uh, you know, when it when it comes down to the comparisons, we're we're gonna have a, a vote here, and I uh, we're not. Fancy oh no, don't do that. Guess, She's on tan and stuff. My one's like PS the Irish bitch. Bro. I don't know how to do that that ma that massive thing where you get super chats and then you and then you have people look at uh you know who's the better looking mom, but um but that's you know <laughs> my mom looks like Edward says her hands. Yours is like. Fucking... <laughs> So Jared, get them pictures of your mom. Right? Yeah, we've already had, so we've had pictures of three of our moms on today, and 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 none of yours, Jared. So I don't think you're going to come by any. Jesus Christ! Okay, I might cut. Well, all right, never mind. Um, yeah, let's let's not go there. No, we're not going to oh, do that. Lord. Um, because we we need to get our four cents of monetization out of this podcast. All right, so the fi the final topic that we have, um. And, and I'm not going to ask for user questions because I don't want to open new thoughts. But if you have any user comments for any of the panelists, uh, put them in now or forever hold your peace. The final thing that happened this morning, Eddie Niketia, um, newly signed, new contract, 100 grand a week, I believe is confirmed. I don't know if that's 100%. Um, and, you know, the, the obvious angle to discuss here is uh, that's not stopping us from getting Gabby Jesus, but it might stop us from getting someone like Osimhen or, um, you know, or or Tammy Abraham or one of the other targets that we were thinking of having. Of course, we're also seeing Twitter, you know, saying that we're in for Christian Nkunku for 100 million pounds, which is the stupidest thing I ever heard, uh, but would make me absolutely fill that condom that I showed earlier um, if it happened. So, Dan, are you going to do any of those kinds of comments on your on your <laughs> man podcast? Oh wow, I just never cease to amaze me when I come on here, man. It's absolute class. Um, big up Pablo, by the way, in the chat. Um, big fan, good lad, Pablo. Um, but uh, yeah, man, this Eddie thing, I don't like it, boys. I ain't gonna lie, I don't like it. I can't sit and try and lie to you and say that it's a great deal. I think 100k a week in the number 14 shirt, which a lot of people say doesn't actually mean anything. Um, but uh, when you're an icon of iconic as Thierry Henry, a lot of people say it will. Um, it doesn't bother me too much that he's got the number 14, but what does bother me is on 100k a week for scoring four goals in six games at the end of the season. And um, I hope and I'm going to only pray that he's the third choice striker and we get two more in, Gabby Jesus being one and hopefully Oshimen being the other or something like that. Because uh, if, if Eddie and Ketia is... If we're a Gabriel Jesus, and if that's his, if he does come, if we're a Jesus signing away from Eddie up top again, then this has been a poor transfer window, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, up 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 top, all the all the things that we're doing, the 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 you know the the rumored left back now, Lissandro Martinez, um, the ankle breaker, or, or what's he called, the executioner, the butcher. Whatever. The butcher. The, slaughter, butcher. the butcher. That's, that's, yeah. not gonna, that's not. If he's the butcher, then what the fuck is Greta Jaka? I mean, I don't. I don't know how wow. that's going to end. But um, you know, it seems like we're kind of doing bits in the transfer market. But but it all comes down to the number nine, though. And I am absolutely in love with the idea of bringing Gabby Jesus here, one hundred percent. And it seems like that's just inevitable at this point. The question becomes, is Niketia an obstacle to signing another striker? Are Arsenal even thinking in terms of bringing in another striker? I think the answer is no. And, you know, we might have to rely on our on our creative outside players, our wide players, and, and tens to, to get on the score sheet. But... The good yeah. thing is we started with Lacazette, Aubameyang and Nketiah. So let's hope that we start this summer with three strikers as well. That's all I can think and pray is that we get... Because we can't go from Lacazette and Aubameyang to Jesus and Nketiah. That's that's not improving. That, that's, that just, is a good, that's a good way of thinking about it. Although I don't know that, that Arsenal always thought of those as being all three in the same central forward position because Aubameyang would play wide a lot and we, you know, and then he would play, you know, not at all. But... Yeah, but when you look at it that way, you do get a sense that Arsenal at least feel like there should be three people in that position. I'll never forget the Man City team that won the league the first time that had uh, Aguero, Dzeko, Balotelli, and Tevez. And I was like, where are they going to fit them all in? Where are they going to fit all those egos in? And it worked. 
So I, I think we should be able to do it three, right? Not, you know, especially in all the different competitions that we have. And that way, Balgan maybe can get another year on loan instead of having to be, you know, a guy that's the first sub in on the attacking side in the Europa League games. Yeah, oh, and, and, and further. On, oh, Jer- Jared, your thoughts on, um, on, on the Nketiah resigning and whether that is essentially closing the door on another striker besides Jesus. So I don't, I, I'm with Dan. I'd like to see two strikers come in. Victor Osimhen for me would be top of my list. He's great. I'd love to see him and Jesus both come in for the Brazil side. Jesus plays wide at times. So I don't think it'd be an issue finding games and spots for both of them. As far as Ngetia, I while I'm not thrilled with it, sort of to play devil at devil's advocate to Dan's point. If, if we're looking at him as potentially a, a third striker, or certainly we can all agree he's not first choice to start the season. To find someone, the 100K a week, so you know 5.2 a year, you're looking at 26 million over five years. To bring in anybody else that's better than Enkedia, I think would cost you more than 26 million, probably just in a transfer to bring them into the club. And that's not considering what they're going to cost you uh, over those four or five year contracts. So he, he's almost a cheaper option to keep him at 100K. And the other side of that is you take someone who would cost that range, be willing to take less than that, that's better than Enkedia, but would also agree to come in as not the first choice striker. I think that combination of stipulations, it would be tough to find somebody that fits that mold because most people that are better than he is or that are 100K a week type of players, they're going to want to be playing and they're going to want some guarantees that they're looked at as at least potentially the number one. I'd find it hard to believe that they told Enkedia that coming in, he's on equal footing with a Gabriel Jesus or a Victor Osimhen or anyone else we sign. Which is I probably the, most, the, no, the reason it took so long to sign him because he wants to be that. So, so mm-hmm. okay, maybe there is a discussion about there's okay for a week for a, a week for a year we're going to do this. We're going to give you 100k. We're going to give you a little bit over probably what you've earned mm-hmm. because because we're not having to pay a transfer fee to replace you, but we're also signing you to a longer term contract so that if you are okay this season, if you're like an all right Europa League guy, if you come in and score your your goals in the cups and you do you know, occasionally all right off the bench in the, in the Premier League, then, then like Dan, can we then sell him for 26, 30 million next year to a, to whatever team has just been promoted out of the, out of the championship or to, you know, a team that's 12th to 15th in the league that is looking for a Premier League experienced goal scorer who might not be good enough for Arsenal, but might be plenty good for them to get to play 90 minutes a week. I like your thinking, um, but we're not Liverpool. We don't do the Rian Brewster, the Jordan Ibe, the Dominic Solanke stuff, do we? We either let them go for nothing or we just uh, sign them up and keep them until they're no good, uh, it seems. That's the way that we run. It's bizarre how it works. Um, we can't seem to just do this business well at all, can we? We're just such a badly run club. Like We can only ask and get offered like 50 to 70 million for Gwen Doozy by PSG and Barca in his first year and then just go to Marseille. You can have him for eight. Um, yeah, it's bizarre. But that's how we work. Um, I don't know that Eddie and Ken here he's going to have the opportunity I have well I hope and pray that he's not going to have the opportunity uh to get anybody coming in for that sort of money because I just don't see how we can allow him to play 20 to 30 games next season uh and give him the opportunity to score that many goals uh, I mean I'd like to ask you guys uh, you know before we come to a close who you'd like to go for who you'd like to see I know Jared said uh, men I like that for me number one for me would be Tammy Abraham um that's the one I'd like to see I don't know if that's realistic. I think it's probably unrealistic, but that's the one I'd like to see. But I would spend eighty that. million on him. So I mean, would I. I, so would I, I. I, I. I'd be upset that we, you know, theoretically, maybe, possibly, could have gotten him for forty-five or fifty last summer. I was all about that, and I know Lacazette kind of stood in the way of us doing that. And I, I, I knew that that was a mistake at the time, even with people saying that, you know, oh, another Chelsea reject. No, he was no Chelsea reject he was a victim of them constantly trying to get the new shiny object to play in front of him. And he had everything he needed to be a star. And, uh, and, and, and I would pay the tax for waiting too long on him because I think that guy would be just a monster in, in the Premier league. If he came back. Yeah. I, I agree with both of you guys. I would take Tammy Abraham in a second. He, he's an absolute baller. Uh, I said, Osaman, that that would be my guy this summer. I'd pay big well, money for him. Is he, is he good? <laughs> My, and, and what I'll say is when you look at Martinelli, Jesus, and Saka, all three, it has nothing to do with their talent or footballing level. All three are fairly reserved, kind of softer personalities. I want to add somebody to our front line that's got an edge he's to him, that has an alpha personality, yeah, he's and just gives us a toughness that we don't have. And I Ebra. think that would be an, a needed element in that group. Zlatan. 
Uh, but uh, so that's, uh, can, can I be really honest? And I, I, I really align with all of your points of view there that we, we need that sort of different profile of striker. But being realistic, lads, there's absolutely fucking no chance of signing anybody like Osemen or Tammy Abraham. Or let's be very realistic as how far this budget will stretch. And I know to a certain extent we've sort of praised the Cronkies, as you said, Mike, reshuffling or whatever you want to call it to make that money available for for Arteta and Eddie to go out and spend, but I, ju- I just can't see it. And I think that here, here's a, here's a question to you, boys, okay? And I know this is slightly swaying away from Arsenal. Well, this has got to be the last yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I, I know that I'm uh, maybe running in, but with the, the introduction of Darwin Nunez to Liverpool and with Erling Haaland to Man City, when I looked at them both last season, when you see that low block style that, Teams play like Real Madrid, Real Madrid Football Club played a low block style against Liverpool in that, in that final. You know, teams play it all the time against Man City. And I think that they're looking, thinking that, do you want to know what? As good as this intricate front three is, is that we need a target man at times. You need somebody to, to pull a goal out of nowhere. Do you think that we're all reverting now back to these sort of conventional, conventional type number nines that, that we used to see? I know that maybe these boys have slightly more to their games than these conventional number nines like Andy Carroll used to have. But do you think that maybe when we are talking about this big physical target, not only are they a rare breed nowadays, but they're also a very expensive breed? And I think it's because Man City were the only exception, and now they've even gone that way now with Haaland, because the Haaland is more of a target man than... He's just a killer in a box, but he is... I mean, he's just ridiculous, and there's nothing else to say about it. You've got Harry Kane, you've got Darwin Nunez now, you've um, you've got the Lukaku, who obviously hasn't worked out, but he's that profile striker, and I think that's why we're trying to... Lewandowski, that's why we're trying to, I think, come up with it. And I think that when you look at what Darwin Nunez, he was the guy I wanted as soon as we didn't get Champions League, I knew that was never going to happen. But that was the number one target for me. I actually really wanted Vlavic. Michael tell you, I really wanted Vlavic. And then, obviously, Darwin Nunez was my number two. Um, and after that, I was thinking, we're kind of a huge step down now in terms of form anyway. But Oshimen and Tammy Abraham, for me, both proved that they're on form. And Tammy Abraham and Gabriel Jesus, to be honest, the reason they're my, two, my, my top two is because they're both hungry to prove so Tammy Abraham coming back to the Premier League would 100% be so, so keen to prove. And Gabriel Jesus will be keen to prove that Man City shouldn't have bothered getting rid of him. So that's why I like that, because they're hungry. I think with Oshimen, the reason it's more of a risk is because he's never played in the Premier League. And of course, that's a risk. Same with Dino Nunez, to be honest with you, and Vlavic. They're always a risk because they come to a different league and it's, it's hard. But that's why I think those two signings for me make sense. And if I was to get two strikers to go with Ed, Eddie and Ketia... For me, it would be Gabby Jesus and Tammy Abraham. Oh, that would be my dream. Uh, that would be my dream. And 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 when you talk about people who are hungry, I'm hungry AF right now. And so we're gonna, yeah, gonna we're gonna finish this podcast. It's it's 10:45 where Dan is. It's 10:45 where Owen is, and it's 5:45 where I am. 4:45 for Jared, and um, and it's dinner time. Um, and uh, I've got some graduation parties to go to. Big ups to Jake for graduating high school yesterday. Absolutely. So, so proud of the boy. Um, he, what a day. Well done, he, buddy. Didn't, he didn't want to take his graduation gown off. I should have taken some, I should have uploaded some pictures to show up for the pod, but it, all you got to do to see pictures of my son is uh, go to the Gooners pod on, on Twitter. I've commandeered the Twitter account to, to essentially make it all about him because I am so proud of that guy. Um, and uh, so, but, but some of his friends are having graduation parties today and I'm already an hour late. So, uh, Owen, Jared, great to see you. Owen, thanks for making the pod twice as long as it was planned to be. Um, and Dan, you're, like you're you're doing bits, man. You're 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 all over the place. Thanks for making time on your Friday night. Um, <laughs> now you're cool, man. And uh, I'm 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 back over again in just over two months. So we got we're gonna coordinate. Oh, amazing, bro. We're amazing. gonna coordinate some stuff. I'm over for some weddings and some arsenal, and uh, and I'll be there with my lovely wife. So I, I might actually have to not have the whole thing of it be about our just don't or... break just don't break any chairs while she's with you man do you know what i mean just, well you know I, I i'm used to i'm used to that she's used to that um let us know where we can find you your new pod your existing pods your other pods uh <laughs> put in a plug for fergus because he got he gave you your start 
Uh, Absolutely, they, man. The parents, because they made you. I mean, that was, you know. <laughs> no, man, listen, the new pod, the new channel is, uh, it, it, it's been a great start, to be honest. I've really enjoyed it. And um, it's been good to get some other people on and, and not just talk Arsenal. So if anyone does want to come and follow and subscribe, it'd be amazing. Um, Football's 12th Man podcast uh, on YouTube. I'm obviously still with Lee Judges TV. Uh, and Guns and Yellow Ribbons is where it all started, man. That, that, that podcast needs some serious subs. I can't believe it's got as little subs as it has. It needs a hell of a lot more, man. They're great, great people, great bunch of people. Um, and most people, I think, know them anyway, to be honest with you. They're getting some really good guests on this season as well. Fergus has been in other touch than and our said... Pod, other than things. our pod, it's the most criminally underwatched podcast, I think, in the of world. Of course. Of course, man. Of course. But uh, no, Fergus and Trev doing bits over there. And um, this season, they've got some great guests coming on. Uh, and they're doing something uh, around contributions to, to the Arsenal world. So they're getting some really good people on over there. So it's well worth a sub because they've got some great content upcoming. Um, so yeah, guys, just follow everyone, man. Just follow it. We're all massively into this. I sub to everybody because I just... I get to a stage where I am actually not on somebody else's to sit there and actually watch stuff instead of being on it. So it's lovely sometimes <laughs> to sit and chill out and actually listen to what's happening. So um, it would be great to uh, if, if you could all do that, man. So appreciate the love and the support and thank you for the plug, Mike. Yeah, it was great to see you, Pablo, uh, as well. And uh, I'll be there for uh, – well, I'll be there during the time that Fulham home, Villa home, and United away. But depending on when those games end up getting moved to, I'm, I'm actually hoping they get moved to the Sundays because I've got uh, weddings on the Saturdays. But uh, but great to see you, Pablo. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to everybody in the chat. Uh, Gary's in the chat. Moss Sports Talk, very active in the chat today. We had Mark McCryden with some good points and one not-so-great point. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you. Cancun Reed uh, was, in the, was in the chat. Of course, Fergus, as Guns and Yellow Ribbons, was in the chat today. Uh, a few more of you were in there. We were pretty much between 20 and 30 the whole time, which is – you know, I'm happy to talk to anyone or more people, and uh, and, and I love it when the chat is active and, and talkative as they were today. So thanks, Dan, for uh, for for. Ah, you're out. welcome, boys. Always a pleasure, man. Oh, and Jared, uh, we will be here. Or some combination of us will be here on Monday night for our TGP Monday night kickoff uh, and banter session, and then we'll have a whole bunch of new shows next week. Uh, one preview of a guest next week, and there will be hopefully Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday next week. Wednesday, we're going to have Ars blog on. He'll be joining us at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll talk about his recent uh, you know, podcast at the uh, at the Union Chapel. And we're looking to have some other Irish case. You know, exactly. And we're going to have uh, we're going to have some great guests on. Uh, the one thing we can be counting on is having the best guests talk to the fewest number of people. So uh, <laughs> that is the that should be our motto as the Gunners podcast. So uh, because I haven't had enough time to do it, we're going to pay our intro as an outro. But thanks for joining us tonight. Come on, you Arsenal, and come on, you Gunners. Once upon a time, way back when there were only 9,000 Arsenal podcasts, five young men from various backgrounds, an Irish kid with a horrible haircut, a young Jewish nerd who hadn't discovered food yet, a child from Hemel Hempstead who didn't want to be English no more. A handsome advertising magnate with impeccable judgment. And a young Mexican AC Milan fan. Hatched a plan to take over the world of Arsenal podcasts. But then these boys became men. Jared. Mikey. Ewan. Magic. And Andy. And the rest, my friends, is history. And now, all these years later, you tune in every so often to hear their incredible takes, their football knowledge, and their sensual advice. But now, it's gone too far. You, our fans, are at long last witness to season... Welcome to the Gooners Pod.